welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and thank you so much for joining us today. We have on the show regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who's one of three reps for the town of Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Hi, Olga. And thank you. Uh, Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury is also with us today. And he sits on the, or he chairs the House Committee on General Housing and Military Affairs, as well as, I believe you're also the Vice Chair of the Department of Liquor and Lottery Task Force. Is that still true? Uh, No, that was a task force that ended a couple of years ago, but thank you so much for having me. The state needs to update its page. (laughs) Um, Yes, it does, but that's... um, That's another story. Yeah. Well, well, we are we, so glad to have you. Before we start, are there other things that our listeners should know about you, Tom? Uh, well, I represent Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Buell's Gore up here in um, just a few miles from, from Montpelier. I don't know if that's considered um, north central Vermont. Um, Buell's Gore is one of those unincorporated villages that's um, I call it a surveying mistake. It's a small triangle on the other side of Route 17 from here. And um, the story goes that Buell uh, challenged his property taxes almost immediately after being granted the land. And seven years later, the courts ruled against him. And he is, according to his Wikipedia page, um, the first Vermonter to leave Vermont because of high property taxes. Oh, we are a stubborn bunch, we Vermonters. From the beginning. So Tom is here to talk with us today about, I'm sure a variety of things knowing us, but what we told him we wanna talk about is the state's basic need budget and what it means to have a livable wage in Vermont. Now, for those who don't know, uh, just about every year, sometimes they miss a year, but every year the Joint Fiscal Office publishes what's called the Vermont Basic Needs Budget and Livable Wage. I highly recommend you read it. It's about 30 some odd pages. And it goes through different household configurations, single person living in a rural area, single person living in an urban area, two adult earners with two children. You know, there's a whole configuration there. And it, it talks you through like what people need to have a livable wage and they work out the budget for what they think would be a sustainable budget that if someone was earning this money and putting it towards you know health insurance and savings and housing and clothing and those sorts of things they would not need state services um, and they would be able to live a sustainable life um, on their own earnings right now the um For the 2019 report, which is the most recent one, a single person in an urban area, we'll just work with that number, the livable wage is $18.09. If you go up to two adults, two children, it's $22.50. And then, of course, there's different wages in between there. My question that I keep coming back to with this report, it's really good, highly recommend people check it out, and yet... It seems like one of those reports that comes out and does it just sit on a shelf? Is it actually used for policy? To me, it seems like it's not. So I'm curious from Emily and, and Tom, what happens to this report once it's it's published? Can I add a little side note before, we, before Tom start, starts beginning to answer that, um, which is this assumption that at a certain income level, people will not use state services. I think that's something that you said, Olga. And we that is something all, that has been told to me by, by people who follow this, yes. We all use state services. I think that's that particular category of state services is what some people might describe as welfare, but we all use state services. We all use roads. Many of us use schools. We have lots of business owners that are using their regional development credit corporations, which are funded by the state. And so we all use state services. It's just one category of state services that some people might describe as welfare that we're talking about when we talk about um, the basic needs budget. So I will get Thank off you for that and turn the mic <laughs> over to Tom. 
No, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for taking this up because um, like everything that happens uh, from, from the government's perspective, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than it seems or a little bit more nuanced than it seems. Um, uh, what the basic needs budget was, it was created by Doug Hoffer, who's currently the auditor, and by Deb Brighton, who is an economist. And I believe there was one other, fo one other person involved who created this probably 15 years or so or more ago. And it's, it was their attempt to try to quantify what it costs to live, in this case, in Vermont. And to me, and, and, I, and I don't mean to disparage the report by saying it's flawed, but they would admit that it's flawed because it can't, it can't take in everything that costs it. What it doesn't account for is things like consumer credit or even college loans, mm -hmm. um, which we know in the last 20 years have become um, pretty substantial chunks of change in people's monthly budgets. And we picked up just for our listeners who are following us on a week to week basis, we picked up this thread about the basic needs budget after having Doug on the show last week and it coming up as sort of a side note in a conversation about the cost of healthcare. And so we're diving deeper from there with Tom. Yes, and, so and, just and before you continue, Tom, I'm very glad you talked about flaw because I think one thing what Emily's comments uh, previously pointed out, and I think what we'll get to as we dig deeper into this, is um, it's hard with systems sometimes because there's things that occasionally they're just completely blind to. And so there are people who are missing from data or what, out, what mm -hmm. have you. Um, from the onset. So sorry, Tom, keep going. No, and, I, and that's fair. And when, when, when we talk about this in our committee, um, and just a quick note on our committee. So general housing and military affairs, military affairs or National Guard type issues, veterans types issues. Housing is mostly about affordable housing, um, but not solely affordable housing. Um, and, and under the general category, we deal with issues that include labor not only union, but things like minimum wage and paid family leave and, um, and a number, a general, because we're general, anything that doesn't neatly fit into any other category. Burials, for instance? Uh, cemetery law, absolutely. Um, so uh, Abenaki re recognition. Um, and on the flip side of that, to just get obscure elevator safety. Um, so it's just, and, and certain licensing, like plumbers and electricians, but not other trades. So it's this... It's this um, cornucopia of, of issues that, um, that we deal with. And this is one of them because it deals with a labor issue. It deals with, um, well, we don't deal with the so-called uh, benefits cliff directly. When we talk about the minimum wage, we do talk directly about the benefits cliffs because we're trying not to have people fall off. And, and, and there's this stereotype that when somebody gets a raise of $2, when they're making way too little money, but if they make $2 an hour more, they might, if they make $1,000 a year more, they might lose $10,000 worth of benefits. Um, so that's, that's very much a part of what this conversation is about, what the basic needs budget tried to do. And they tried to give a ballpark figure, but because they were the joint fiscal office, because they were analysts that, you know, they're just taking information and putting it together and coming up with these numbers. And these numbers are, um, again, the livable wage. This basic needs budget is not a livable wage. And because a livable wage could be $22 an hour in Burlington to pay for rent. And so and this is specifically for people who rent, I think. Um, it's geared towards people who are at the lower end of the economic spectrum, perhaps of a lower age, but not solely. Um, it talks about child care, it talks about expenses, household expenses. And when it comes to things like affordable housing, you're talking about, you know, what makes housing affordable is that if you can pay for your housing with 30% of your income, and that's housing, it's not just the rent, it could be the oil, it could be the, the cable, it could be everything else that's involved with it. So this was an attempt by JFO and by the, and by the economists that work on this to, um, to have a number yeah, does it, what do we do with it? Um, the state relies on this number as a base. And so uh, what's up prior to our raising the minimum wage over two steps coming up in the next two years, uh, 
and we had tried to get to $15 an hour, it would have obliterated this basic needs budget, right? Because $13.34 an hour per person in an apart in an, in a, in a in a relationship or what have you is let would be less than the 15. But this is still going to be a little bit higher. And I think the numbers, Olga, that you quoted, I think like on page six or so, there's a good simple chart that gives you that idea. So $13.34 an hour might be at on average might be, you know, $16 or $17 an hour or $26 or $27 an hour for all of the expenses in a in a two person household, whether it's your roommate, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a um, uh, so you're saying if there's two earners in the household, then people could meet their basic needs budget at, at like twenty six dollars an hour or yeah. more. You know, just more and more, more in Chittenden County, for for instance, and perhaps mm -hmm. more in in Brattleboro, depending on what the the, the cost of living is. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand. So we have a minimum wage, which has no relationship to this directly to really anyone's. Right. anyone's anyone's need to earn <laughs> it's a yes. it's a minimum wage yeah and you know and then we have this basic needs which is the state trying to say that this is based on our analysis of these numbers this is the best number that we can come up with which should which in some people's opinions should be the minimum wage mm -hmm. and then you have a livable wage which i think we all know is a little bit higher and and certainly there are advocates who have come up with the 21 or 22 dollars an hour uh, in in burlington for instance because rents are so much higher mm -hmm. and one of the things that i tried to do when i'm taking my committee through this bill i've gone through it six years it's supposed to be biennial so it's supposed to be every other year thank you yeah you know, so they're working on it uh, well given COVID, who knows, but they're supposed to be working on it now so that in January, 2021, there will be another report filed that takes into account inflation or perhaps some big change in, um, but not as big a change as like COVID um, in, in the way that things cost. And so is this helpful for us in understanding year to year, how much a Vermonter's costs might be going up? So I it's, Increases I think it in is. rent, increases in health premiums, increases I, I, in childcare. I, I think it is helpful as long as you, as long as you accept the fact that it has flaws. Yeah. You know, so to quote it as something to say, um, well, you know, the basic needs is thirteen thirty four an hour. Why should I pay any more than that? Um, that's telling you that you only need the basic needs, and that's mm -hmm. kind of a systemic issue with when we talk about minimum wage. We're and assumes like, that everyone is partnered. Yes. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. know, absolutely. And so it, it's, and so again, to speak in favor of what JFO has done, they've provided a number that the government relies on itself. And when we do two or three hours talking to the person from JFO or to Deb Brighton about this, to get an explanation and to really talk through some of the th pieces that are missing, like you can't assume that everybody has college debt. You can't assume that everybody has uh, consumer debt um, because they may not even have a credit card if they're at a, at this economic level. Um, so they made choices that that are limiting. But again, if you understand that it's not a solid number, but it but conceptually it's a it's a very useful number because it puts into a context. It puts the state. It, it has the state say something about what the context of poverty is. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, I think the, at the end of this report, you'll see that there's a, uh, a re, uh, kind of a summary of what happens in other states and, and, and how they manage, how other states try to measure similar things. And it's a, like anything else between states, it's a little bit different. But again, in our committee, what's important is that it gives us a frame. And when we hear this in January, at the beginning of a biennium, it gives a frame to the rest of our conversations about the poverty issues that our committee deals with, again, specifically with, with minimum wage, or, um, but it also human services right next door to us is dealing with the, whether it's a child care benefit or whether it's um, so-called welfare programs, food stamps. Um, those are all issues that we don't have control. There, there's a lot of those that we don't have control over, but, what I like to do in my committee is then to take this number 
and extrapolate it because we talk about it as if 1334 is a lot of money per hour when the minimum wage is $11 or, you know, two years ago it was 1050. Um, it's not. And, and I, I like to say, well, what is, what is an average person work? Um, is it a 35 hour work week now? Is it a 40 hour work week now? And if you got paid $15 an hour, um, what would that be? Well, it's $600 a week. That's 30,000 plus dollars a year is all. And that is something that is um, maybe brought home to people who all of a sudden were unemployed and for a few months they got an extra $600 in their unemployment check, which gave them a for, sort of a false sense of what unemployment really is, what employment, unemployment payments really are. But that $600 a week was so necessary for people to maintain their payments that they would have lost you know, that they, whether it was insurance, health insurance payments, whether it was car payments, mortgages, you know, that $600 went right out. And so it's important for us to realize that when we talk about $15 an hour or $13 an hour, that you understand that we're talking about $30,000 a year, or if you only work 35 hours a week, that's $27,000 a year. Well, can I ask a question about that framing? So when we're talking about $13 an hour, is that us talking about a single person with no dependents? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, and no, so, that's, that's and talking so, about salary. That's just talking about one person's salary. Yeah, matter. but like that as a that as a basic needs budget, that's one person who's that's one single person, right? Yes. And yes. so what I want us not necessarily in this room because I think we do this, but as a community, as community of legislators or as a community in my own community, get our head around is how few people live like that, right? Is how that- How few people live like what? Like it's just a single person with their single person expenses. So, you know, we, the bulk of the people who might be making $13 an hour are single mothers or are, um, you know, someone living with their grandmother who they're caring for too, right? And so the composition of family and how earnings come into a family and how earnings go out of a family sometimes makes things much more stable, but more often than not tends to make things less, you know, tends to increase the expenses um, and lower the power of those earnings. Well, it, it, forces you to work 60 hours a week yeah. instead of 40 hours a week. Um, the other fact that you should hold always in these conversations about poverty, um, forget, forget about what the level of poverty is. It's so, it, you know, there's, when it comes to housing, you're talking about um, how many times the area median income mm -hmm. that, that you could qualify for, or what percentage of the area median income. But when you're talking about um, maybe child care subsidies, you're talking about how many hundreds of percent of the poverty are you at as at a family of mm -hmm. two or three or four or five. So it gets a little, it gets very confusing. But when we were doing the and can I and yeah. I, I think the problem with it getting I mean things get confusing and we can sort of find our way through charts and that's difficult. But I think one of the problems with it getting confusing is I think we lose track of how many people of different family compositions sit in all those different places because we keep on reshuffling the um, sections in the chart that I all of a sudden I've lost the name. We, we, we can reshuffle them. Percentiles, the, that would be the word I was looking for. Right. And what makes it even more difficult is that the federal numbers haven't changed no. when it comes to the hundreds of percent of poverty. So when you say if you're a, if you're a uh, one person with a child or, or with two children and the level of poverty is is twenty one thousand dollars a year again do the math on what that's that's less than 13 that or that might be 13 dollars an hour mm -hmm. um for 40 hours a week but the other thing that that really we tried to make clear to people in this state is that 144 plus thousand vermonters who file income taxes make less than $27,000 a year. And it add another 75,000 income tax paying Vermonters to get to $45,000 a year. 
you're talking about 225,000 Vermonters who make less than $45,000 a year. How many Vermonters are there? Like what percentage of people working is that? There's 300 and say 60,000 income taxpayers that, that if you go to the tax website, you can get this breakdown. And so, you know, 110,000, if you go to, I think it's um, 100, no, it's 310,000 income taxpayers file tax reports for less than $100,000 a year, something like that. That's like, that's the bulk of income taxpayers that make, you know, families, singles, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's a substantial number. It is the bulk of us, but just, just to focus on the $27,000 number um, as, as for $15 an hour for 35 hours a week, which I'm going to say is humane. You know, I mean, you're, you're still making less than, you know, you're, you're working less than 40 hours or you're not getting paid for your lunches or whatever it is. But that's not a lot of money. And that's just, you know, so that when you think about like, well, how does that make you eligible for affordable housing? Well, if your rent is, if your rent and your, your living expenses due to housing are 30% of that, that's $9,000 a year. Um, and that's gross. That's before, you know, other taxes. And at nine thousand dollars a year, you're talking about less than you know less than nine hundred dollars a month for rent or for housing expenses. And where can you live for that now, except as a partner, except as a roommate in in another apartment, um, you know, in an apartment with other people? And and so often as a person who stays in a romantic relationship that they don't want to be in, it, it brings that up, yeah. in, in, you know, in, intensely. Um, it is, uh, I'm working in the, during the off season, the last two years, I've worked at a farm with a bunch of 20 year olds or 25 year olds. And they're living in housing with three or four other people because, you know, when I was 25, I did the same thing. You know, you just live with roommates and you find a, you find a place that's big enough. So it doesn't seem like you're paying too much money in rent. You just don't have any privacy or it's not your life yet, or that is your life. And it's, it's reasonable for that time period. But if you are a single mother um, of any age, but you know, we, we know from our work on the minimum wage that you know, over 50% of the folks, you know, the average age of people making the minimum wage is closer to 35 or 38 than it is to 17. And so the stereotype is that, well, teenagers don't need to make $15 an hour. Uh, and it's like, it's not about teenagers. It's about mostly women. And most of those are single women. And how, how you, it, so never mind all these other, never mind the basic needs budget. Because the basic needs budget is based on having a household income of 26 or $27 an hour in a rural place with two wage earners. So it's, pre, it's pretty, um, so to your original question, it's a springboard, <laughs> it's a springboard for our committee anyway to try to get a handle on and to try to put a frame to how fragile the economy is for most of the people who work in the state of Vermont. And that is a large weight to carry that doesn't really, um, by the time a bill comes to the floor in the house in Montpelier, uh, you know, Emily might be a, is, is on a different committee. She might have no idea what we're talking about when we're talking about minimum wage and what the nuances are. And, and, and in, in the testimony in that particular year, or that biennium, and it just like, I may not know what's going on in her committee. And so you end up with these, with these things that people don't want to hear. Um, you know, if you add the, if you add the idea of what privilege is, people don't want to hear the fact that 144 plus thousand people make less than $27,000 a year. They just, uh, people can't, they can't handle that. I think that I agree. And I wonder how much of that is, so is our inability to process numbers rather than visuals, right? And I think part of that is the problem is that we have the basic needs budget and we have the minimum wage and we have the living wage and we have, you know, all those different, um, percentiles. And so we lose our ability 
to sort of close our eyes and imagine how many houses or households in our own communities someone is not making a basic needs, like not obtaining a basic needs budget with their earnings. And so I wonder like what, how we can help our colleagues like really get their bodies and their hearts around this sort of understanding of our communities. Cause I think, you know, poverty is so hidden in Vermont um, and even how we define poverty in Vermont is so different than I think many other places do. And so I think sometimes when we talk about poverty in Vermont, we are only talking about really, really extreme poverty. Whereas when we look at the numbers, it seems to me that, you know, we could say that anyone who is not meeting a basic needs budget with their earnings would be living in poverty. And so like what, I wish numbers worked, they don't for most people. And so how do we like, I don't know, do we like make maps that are color coded and paste them on the whole floor? Or, you well, know, no, cause, no, it's, actually, I, I'm going to stop. Could, sorry, Tom um, and Emily, yeah. I'm going to stop you there because we need to go to break uh, to hear from some of our underwriters. But I'm really glad that both of you brought this up because the theme for me right now is disconnect. And, and I hope our listeners sort of ponder some of Emily's questions and, and um, have some thoughts when we, we come back from break. So the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro will return in a moment. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. One day I'll do that all in one breath. Just as a reminder for our listeners, the conversations and the opinions here in the show are ours and ours alone and not that of the radio station. Tom, let's go back to the question that Emily was bringing up at the end of the, the previous section about how do we get the folks uh, who are making the plans, making the decisions, in this case, the legislature, to really wrap themselves around um, what so many people in the state are actually living with. Well, that, Olga, that's like the hardest nut to crack inside the building because between having the lack of time and the lack of capacity and the lack of staff to sort of get at um, the statistics and the data to get past that and get to the humans involved uh, is, really, is really hard to do in Montpelier. And we tend to um, we tend to judge people based on who we are or who we think the base minimum should be. Uh, you know, should I have, should, well, if that person loses their job, I mean, why can't I just get another job? You know, why can't I just do that? What if they have mental health issues? What if they have health issues? What if they have something that, you know, that, that, that Facebook meme of, you know, just being really attentive to walking in other people's shoes, not knowing what, what troubles people bring. When people who are, who are um, suffering from poverty, experiencing homelessness, they're not really anxious to come and talk about it because of the shame involved or because of the embarrassment or because they're busy working three jobs to try to make ends meet. And I think those of us in the state house, those of us, um, I mean, I always assume that based on a human, human based value system, not even a Republican or Democrat or progressive, that you, you, know, that you, that you care about the next person. And that is really hard to get to, again, when you're in this maelstrom of, of, of data and charts and whatnot, to really personalize it and understand that, you know, if I go down that road, there's a mobile home or two or three. And again, there's a classic, you know, well, just because they live in a mobile home doesn't mean that they're not millionaires. But, you know, when you see their children in school and their children are always have a runny nose or have roomy eyes or smell like an ashtray or whatever it is, we're trained some, just because to make decisions about who these folks are. And it's- Well, we're trained because we live in a deeply classist capitalistic society, right? It's not- well, Absolutely, but yeah. that's what we're, you know, but we don't, yeah, even, absolutely. we don't even get that. No. In, State house because you're dealing in a building in a not hermetically sealed building, but you're dealing with. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, this, you know, P 
people can say on the floor of the house what I'll what I'm about to say now is like I grew up in a house that would be considered that when I was growing up I considered it lower middle class. It wasn't low class. It wasn't poor. It was just lower middle class, and that was something I learned to say so that I wouldn't have to say that we were poor. And you know, yeah, but the shoes I was wearing didn't fit. The pants were too short. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The food was you know powdered milk at times. But did, you, I, did anybody know? Did anybody share those? We had two cars most of the time. You know, we lived in a house. We weren't kicked out. We weren't homeless. So did people know that we, besides family members, that we were poor? Um, and what would have been the point of that? And so a lot of folks don't care what, we, what the policies are. They care when the paycheck, their paychecks get higher, you know, and they, and they, and they care about how... Um, if they have to pay for childcare, how are they gonna get there? And those are the programs that we try to provide and then try to reach out to those communities so that we can, you know, if you're making 13, 34 an hour, or the household's making $26 an hour and you need to help pay, and you don't make more than 200% of the poverty level, um, you need to apply for a sub childcare subsidy. And again, so that's and what- I don't expect people who aren't making a living wage to care at all about what I'm doing in the legislature necessarily. And one of my favorite moments when I was campaigning the first time was someone saying, I used to vote and my life hasn't changed at all. And so I don't really know why I should keep on doing it. And I was like, fair, so fair. Um, but what I do expect is that we all in the legislature will care about all of these people not making a living wage and we'll design programs based on an image of really the vast majority of, almost the majority of Vermonters are struggling rather than it's this small minority of desperate poor that we have a stereotype about. Right. And so the, like, how so do we- The other, you know, it's the, it's like, well, there's poor people in your town, but not in mine, you know? Yeah. And, and like, no, that's not the truth. But, but you're right, there, there's that, again, I, it goes back to the, it goes back to the fact that people have a hard time admitting that that there are there is abject poverty, and all you have to do is look at the tax returns of people, and say how does anybody live filing a tax? And I don't care how many t income taxes they actually pay, but when you look at the income of people at the lowest end, of under twenty seven thousand dollars a year, it is a substantial number of people. And we don't talk about them that way. We talk about them as if they're a small percentage of people. You know, only only 10 or 12 percent of the people make the minimum wage of working Vermonters out of that out of that 360 some odd thousand. You know, but still, that's 36,000 people. You know, making the minimum wage. Um, so it's it, almost it, the population of Wyndham County. Right. Absolutely. Just to put that in context. And Absolutely. so that that really helps, right? That gives people a clear visual. The population of Wyndham County is making the minimum wage. And so um, folks from Wyndham County, re representatives from Wyndham County will get that. You know, you could say 144,000 are making less than $27,000 a year and go, oh my God, that's Chittenden County. You know, will those Chittenden County's representatives from Milton or, you know, any place else in, that's not Burlington understand that? Um, but so, so I think it's a fair question. I think it's one of the biggest issues that we have as representatives is that we have the ideas and we have the heart and we have, you know, people have different ideas, of course, about whether we should support this issue or that issue if it deals with so-called poor people or union people or what have you. But it is, um, it is, it is the hardest thing is to, is to turn around and personalize it, which is why I like to go from the 200% of poverty to an actual number. And just say that that there's this many people who actually make this amount of money, whether you like it or not. Here's the fact. And so the next step for me is to say, if we think that it's actually the majority of Vermonters who are having a hard time paying their bills, rather than this small minority of Vermonters, then how does that change how we structure benefits programs? And how does mm -hmm. it change? How does it change today when 80,000 more people might be yeah. classified as, as suffering from poverty after the mm -hmm. pandemic or during the yeah. pandemic? Um, I, you know, how do you structure them? How do you keep saying the words like we need more capacity, which is money and people um, versus the people who say that government's too big? Mm -hmm. um, Childcare for all, 
that sounds great. That would be great. That would be wonderful. That would be Denmark, I guess. But it would be, um, it would be what we what we would consider prohibitively expensive. Um, is it the wrong amount of money? Probably not. But being prohibitively expensive, I mean, it, here's so here's another con contextual thing. When we were doing paid family leave, one of the issues was, well, how are you going to pay for it? And what are you paying for? So forget the what are we paying for, but the number that we came up with out of our committee, which changed as it went through the House and then it went through the Senate. But the number that we came up with in our, actually, I'm sorry, this is what we came up with in the House, was 0.55% on an income tax for people who made up to $145,000 a year would raise, now get this, it would raise, now that's five and a half cents for every $10 that one makes. So even for people at the bottom end of the, uh, of, the, of the pay scale, shouldn't really notice, especially if they were getting a raise to $15 an hour, right? It was one of those, it was one of those washes that you're just like, how can you not see this? It would have raised $83 million. We talk about raising taxes in ways that are like, oh, we'll raise a tax of $17 million. What? You're raising taxes $17 million? That's obscene. You people just raise taxes all the time. That's like 0.55%, five and a half cents for every $10 you earn. And that's not even at the top, you know, three or 4% of our economic ladder. It's kind of matching the social security cap. Like $83 million is not chump change when you come into every year with a budget deficit or a budget gap. It's not a deficit, but a budget gap of anywhere between 40 and $80 million. And if you use that money, in that case, it would have been used to help fund the paid family leave bill. Which would be an incredibly broad-based economic benefit to families. And so if you're and small immediately- and, and small And oh, so much small businesses. And we talked about this actually a lot last week. Yeah. Is, um, how much that helps small, that universal programs like that help small businesses just as much as they help individuals because it's incredibly expensive for small businesses to offer those programs on their own. Right, and you, and you end up, again, to me, I was like, are you kidding? Like if we cap this at $145,000 annual salary at 0.55%, we would raise $83 million. That's just, you know, to me, it was individually, it, indiv to the individual income taxpayer, that's chump change. And yet look at what it can do. Now, okay. you know, do I, would I rather want to turn that tax rate around and put a higher tax rate, just like any progressive or progressive Democrat would want to do on, on the people who have made out like bandits with the Trump tax cuts and the Bush tax cuts in front of that? Absolutely, but it's um, but for the for, for the for the services that you were providing to the people who don't have it, it, it was pretty reasonable, I thought. And so, how do you so so you take that and you go look how many, how look how much people freaked out over that. Never mind the existing things that happen. We don't pay enough money out of the money that is supposed to go towards affordable housing. We had to make an incredible investment, which I'm still hoping by the end of the year, we can just say, look, we did this on, on, on housing the homeless. Because when COVID popped up, we said, if you're going to have a stay at home, a stay safe at home order, you have to have a home to stay safe in. And we got people out of, out of their um, shelters, which are never the preferred place to put homeless people, you know, but it's the only place you can put them when it's really cold out in the winter and they don't have a home. Um, we put them in motels and now we're building, we're building hopefully temporary housing, transitional housing for them. Um, but that was coronavirus money. And in Brattleboro, that's a really exciting program. It's probably gonna house about a fifth of the folks who are in hotels right now. Um, yeah, and across the state, I think we're on track. If all the programs go through, we're on track to creating at least, at least five or 600 units that didn't exist before. And we had mm -hmm. 2000 people living in motels, which included 300 kids. And so if we back up to this idea of what is affordable. Um, we, we talk about how to define affordable a lot on this show. Yes, we do, we do. <laughs> so we back up to the idea of what is affordable and we have this basic needs budget. And then we think about other programs that really, you know, in the basic needs budget are all of these costs that are all sort of the burden of the private payer right? 
there's healthcare, there's um, taking time off to care for loved ones, there's sick time, there's childcare. Those are all the burden of the individual payer. And if we think about how some of those options, some of those things could become universal programs, then the basic needs budget doesn't necessarily need to be as high. And so we have a way of sort of shifting the living wage a little bit in a state that has, I think, been struggling perhaps since um, Mr. Buell left his gore um, with making wages, with wages that are really high enough to meet the needs of the folks who live here. Well, and the wage issue is, of course, that leads to everything. Yeah. Uh, we, we just saw it on a chart and I had a community forum this week and one of my opponents is a big anti-tax person. And so I just did a little bit of research on, because there had been some- Did you bring a whiteboard there. to your forum? I the... didn't, I didn't. But what I did was I, was, I we were, um, I don't know who shared it with us, but it was information that came from the Department of Labor Statistics and it showed that Vermont wages are approximately 16.5 or 16.8 percent less than the average in new england mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and there you go you know we used to call it a few years ago the you know the the vermont you know whatever you know what do you call it when you move to vermont you get a job the lifestyle and, tax you know the lifestyle tax or the, you know it, it I, i'm about to call it the vigorish you know the but but it is that idea that you take a pay cut in order to live in a place that is as beautiful as this and and you can afford you can somehow make ends meet, you know, moonlighting in Vermont. Um, you can, you can, you can do things here that you can't do anyplace else. And we um, romanticize that instead of saying that somehow we have set Vermont up to be essentially a developing nation rather mm -hmm. than, you know, on par with its neighbors. Well, it only works if you forget that there's 144,000 people who make $27,000 yeah. or less or 225,000 who make less than, than, than $45,000, $47,000 a year. It is, you have to forget those things in order to buy into the romanticism of it. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is easy to do because we do so well with so, even our affordable housing industrial complex is very mature um, we do incredible work across the state uh, in, in the way that we're, with the money that we get in, in creating affordable housing, and it's still way not enough. No. And, you know, um, Brattleboro has definitely one of the lowest vacancy rates and some of the highest housing costs in the state. And that's yeah, every place except Barry. Yeah, every, yeah. every place yeah. else except, I mean, Barry has a 9% vacancy rate because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of landlords who don't live there who don't want to rent to people because tenants are trouble. One other, th um, I think, one other reason I think it's really easy for us to forget how many folks um, are making so little money is because the jobs they work in are designed to be invisible jobs. And mm -hmm. in the bucolic splendor of an image of Vermont that we have, the people who work at the country store, the people who work at the ski mountain, the people who, um, you know, serve you your microbrew, they're part of the scenery. They're not part of the whole picture. And yet a great number of them were essential workers just a couple of months ago. Indeed. Indeed. And that is, you know, and that's something again, that, that, I don't know how long it'll last, but when you have 80,000 people who get unemployment all of a sudden, you know, and, and probably 75,000 of them had never received unemployment before in their lives, mm -hmm. um, no matter how difficult it was to get your your money, you know, you got it and then you were taken care of again until July 31st anyway, or until, you know, the, the money ran out. And, and, you know, so maybe people just got a small got a small view of what it's like to, you know, A, have an entitlement or have insurance that's there to help prop you up. But I, I don't count on that lasting. I don't think that those 80,000 people are any more big fans of government than they were, um, you know, eight months ago. But they know that we helped them. And they know that we have tried our best to get money out to them during this pandemic. Um, but that took away, that takes away from, again, Emily, your question about how do you structure services so people can get what they need. And, and when we go through a normal austerity-based budgeting process that tries to do a little bit more with a little bit less all the time, instead of, instead of the, the moral budgeting that we tried, you know, that we thought we had passed the, you know, and, and you put to, that in statute, right? 
we yeah. did, you know, where you're supposed to budget to the need and not to the number. And we've yeah. never deviated from that. And that's a, that's a, that's a better within that confine, but it is difficult to, uh, you know, it's difficult to convince people that if you start with the need first, um, that might give you a more realistic picture of how much things were supposed to cost. Never mind, to not just say this is what I have. It, it fascinates me. This is the fiction writer in me, but I am always fascinated about the stories we tell ourselves about different situations. And it seems to me, boy, Vermont, when it comes to issues around wages, particularly, and, and um, poverty and income and work in the big picture, boy, we have some at the core, some really messed up stories that I, I think we're telling ourselves. And in, in a way, Emily touched on this when she said, how do we get our lawmakers to, to step into these other experiences. And I guess I would say even on the big picture, you know, Vermont needs to really get honest with itself, I think. I think sometimes Vermont has bought into its own marketing mm -hmm. and, and that's a problem <laughs> and <I laughs> because think we can no longer live up to that marketing. And I think when we buy into that marketing, we all get really, really lonely because you start to think you're the only person who's struggling, who can't, yes you know, who's working 50 hours a week and, you know, still making it home to make the pickles and do the adorable apple picking with the kid and take care of your neighbor and show up for town meeting every year. And so when I think about the and challenges- And if you can there's something wrong with you. Yes, and so yeah, I right. think about the challenge to participate in democracy and it's that shame of not being able to make it work because we all have this story that somehow we have time to you know, help our communities make pickles and work 60 hours a week. And very few of us do. And we don't tell those stories to each other the same way that we don't tell the stories about, you know, our abortions or our troubles in our relationships or, our, you know, or our poverty, or you know, poverty, our own yeah. poverty. And, I, you know, just to, I, I assume we're coming close to the end, but Indeed. I just want to, I just want to, you know, I do want to um, buy into the Vermont thing a little bit here, just in closing. So, cause I want to end on a positive note. Um, I, I do think that no matter what the reality of these issues are, that we do, at least in our caucus and, and in the progressive caucus, I can't speak for, for the Republican caucus and won't in our in the legislature. But I think that we have moments where it is clear. And I think COVID is one of them. I mean, we focused when we had to focus on saving small businesses and putting homeless people into uh, not not just putting them into motels we were like we did the right thing now what's the next right thing and the yeah. next right thing is finding them a more permanent home because we know that this will happen and this will happen and this will stability helps mm -hmm. across the board and i do think that there is a focus on this now there there are things that hold us back the reality of governing holds us back at times but i do think that as a whole our legislature does incredible things that I don't see happening elsewhere under the same context. And that's, and that has to do with the small size of the state, with the fact that our districts are only at, on average, you know, 4,000 people per representative. I mean, mine's 8,000, yours is 12,000. Well, I don't know, maybe. No, you mine's four. I'm a single seat district. Right. And I'm a it's double a seat district. So I yes. have to pay for, you know, I have to pay attention to 8,500 people and that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's still minimal compared to, you know, the real world or the rest of the world. But we do work on these issues and they are front and center. Um, and if and if we could vote on the budget in February when everybody's hearts were all wide open after listening to all the testimony of all the new bills that were being put forward, we would budget based on need and not on the number. And then you realize, oh, the appropriations committee is working with a number and not a need and that's that's hard but they do i mean i know the people we all you know those of us who work in the building we know the people on the appropriations committee there's there's very few if any people who are sitting there saying oh i'm really enjoying cutting this budget you know i'm really enjoying staying this ahs budget you know it is the largest piece of the budget we should probably cut it by two percent who would miss it um we know that those things matter 
But it's also very interesting to say that, you know, there was a time last year when we were talking about all of this stuff. And I had I had members of three other different committees in my committee room that I'd never had before. And I had the CFO from the, from the Agency of Human Services in the committee. And it was almost like they were hearing our issues, which were more human than numbers, for the first time. And they could see their jaws drop about, well, why do we care about this in the way that we do? And then the Human Services Committee person could talk about why they care about these things the way that they do. And then the Healthcare Committee could talk about why they care. And they're all... That, that element of holistic conversation. Mm -hmm. And then we had AHS right there. We had the CFO of AHS who knew where all the money was and who knew that our Medicaid budget is going to suck next year. And, and you could just see the effect that it had when people began to see the whole picture. That doesn't mean we have the solutions yet because sometimes the solutions is only money. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's, it's, it's how do you make the money happen? And that's what makes this work hard for those of us who lay their, put their hearts on their sleeves all the time and say, oh, I can't vote for this budget because it doesn't have, it cut $150,000 from this. It's like, well, did it get 92% of what you were looking for? You know, is it good enough at a 92% rate? And it's like, you know, there's, those are the questions that we have to answer for ourselves all the time. But it's, um, I think we, the, at the best of times, we acknowledge the difficulties, we acknowledge that we may leave people behind and we don't feel good about it. And we get up and say, we're gonna do it again next year and we're gonna keep fighting um, and see what we can do the next time. And that's, that's, what makes, that's what makes the job good. That's what makes it hard um, is knowing that sometimes, sometimes you, as long as you're moving forward somehow, then you'll get the work done. And that's a pilot. I call it the pilot light of hope because that goes out. <laughs> and you might not know this about me, Tom, but I actually live on Good Enough Road. That is the name of the road I live on. And I am very hopeful. And we've been talking about this since the beginning of the pandemic, Olga and I, that the further um, exposure of the cracks in our system that came from the pandemic have really helped so many more of us get our heads around what the next steps need to look like. I'm really yeah. grateful for that. So and on that note, Olga, do you have a toast for us? I do have a toast. Okay. We have come sadly to the end of our conversation for today. I want to toast to the pilot light of hope. I want to toast to even COVID for helping us show, see the cracks in our system. And I want to toast to doing the next right thing. Thank you for joining us today, Tom. Thanks for having me. This was fun.